from the American Society for Microbiology and Microbe TV. This is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 394, recorded on June 18th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we're coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. We are at ASM Microbe, the big meeting that covers the entire scope of microbial sciences from fundamental to clinical applications. And there are over 11,000 people attending this meeting. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. And not in Western Massachusetts at the moment, but I got up at five o'clock this morning to get here at, uh, for this, this bright and early event. You didn't fly in today, no. right? No, no, it's way too expensive to fly into Boston. It would not have been faster anyway. <laughs> Last time we did a TWIV uh, in vivo, Alan yeah. flew in to Pennsylvania yeah. himself with the Alan Dove Airlines. That's ADA, right, Alan, right, Alan Dove Airlines. Very good. Well, thanks for coming. Good to see you. We have a guest today who's also attending the meeting, and she is from the Scripps Research Institute, Erica Ullman Sapphire. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Finally got you on TWIV. <laughs> <laughs> Tried so many times. She's always traveling, busy person, but I, I am persistent, if anything. So we got you here. And we have a great audience. Thanks for coming in at this early hour. It really is, is appreciated. And we have great weather. What is the weather? It is gorgeous. It is, there, I can see a window out this way. It's been gorgeous <laughs> all week long. It's just absolutely lovely. And for people who are not from the New England area, it is normally miserable around here. So this is really, really unusual. Yeah, it's very nice. They brought it yeah. in just for uh, ASM microbe. Right? It's 21 Celsius, uh, dew point is nine Celsius. So we have uh, an entire episode to focus on you, oh boy. Erica. Yes. Isn't that great? <laughs> and uh, you've done a lot of cool things, and we're going to talk about them. But I would like to first hear from you a little bit about uh, your history. Where are you from originally? Austin, Texas. Ah. Yeah. And uh, went to high school in Austin? Uh, a little town outside, Lago Vista. It was about a 2,000-person town at the time. It was about a 45-minute drive from hmm. the grocery store. Wow. Yeah. So where's that in relation to Buta? <laughs> oh God, I can't remember who it is. Um, we are. We have a running joke on the show about Buta. Okay. So. My high school graduating class for the public school was about 30 people. <laughs> and I was the only kid that wanted to take calculus, so I took it off a TV screen. <laughs> where you had a phone where you could call in. The teacher was in San Antonio, and there were all the individual kids in tiny towns scattered around Texas, and you called in on the phone when you had a question. And she would periodically call on you to make sure you were there wow. Wow. and watching. That's impressive. So uh, where did you go to college after that? I went to Rice University in Houston. OK. The big city. Yeah. Uh, but Rice is uh, wonderful. I worked harder at Rice than I ever have anywhere else. And uh, from Rice, I went to the Scripps Research Institute for grad school. And uh, I met my husband three weeks after arriving, and he's a native <laughs> Californian. And uh, so Scripps gave me my own lab, and I've been there ever since. So uh, Rice, uh, we, we stole the president of Rice at Columbia, George Rupp, right? Yes. Is that his name, George Rupp? Did you, did his you signature write? is on my diploma. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> I remember George. I gave a university lecture, and George sat in the front row sleeping. <laughs> the whole thing. I felt so bad. You know, when you see people sleeping, sometimes you try and speak louder to wake them up, but it didn't work. What about all those studies about absorbing information? Maybe, maybe he was he just is, really concentrating. Maybe he was absorbing it. Yeah, that's fine. I have nothing against George. It's just, it was, that's the one thing I remember uh, about George. So was it in this small high school that you got interested in science? I got interested in science uh, through my parents. They were both public school teachers, and so mm. they had the whole summer off. And when you have the whole summer off, uh, you throw the kids in the station wagon and you go camping. And so we'd spend every summer going up the west coast into Canada, going up the east coast into Canada, going down into Mexico, seeing every national park and state park along the way. And I was just 
fascinated by the ecosystems and all the different ranger lectures at night. You know, every night in the national parks and the campgrounds, a ranger gives a lecture about this is how you tell all the different trees apart in Sequoia National Park and look at their bark and this is what you learn. Or the, the ranger in Acadia was talking about the tide pools and of course, you know, the, the ocean is just stunning, incredible and changing all the time. So that, that got me interested in biology. And uh, at Rice, I double majored in ecology and biochemistry because I was still really interested in ecology and I was always looking for a way to put the molecular back together with the ecosystem to find out how changes on the nucleotide level or the amino acid level ultimately affect what happens in the One of the first antibodies that could broadly neutralize most kinds of HIV and neutralize the primary isolates, and so that was a big deal at the time. Right. And I thought, well, this is a molecule that needs its structure solved. So you need to figure out what it looks like, mm -hmm. how it works, how it interacts with GB120. And so I went and asked for that, and that um, became a rotation project in Ian Wilson's lab, and that rotation project took me six years to do. <laughs> and so that became my PhD. It's a long rotation. And that got me into viruses. And from Wonderful. there, I opened up my own lab. So I picked my own subject. Great, great cool. story. I like the clouds parting yes, part. Yes, that's it's really good. Uh, we, I want to talk about your science clearly, but I want to first uh, tell everyone that you're here because you're the recipient of the 2016 Eli Lilly and Company Elanco Research Award from ASM. Congratulations. And this is ASM's oldest and most prestigious prize. It rewards, this is reading from the description, it rewards fundamental research of unusual merit in microbiology or immunology by an individual on the threshold of his or her career. And uh, congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Great. This is an old award. The first winner in 1936 was Harry Eagle. Does, it, does that name ring a bell? Yeah, e but I remember. Eagle medium. Oh my God. Right? Cell culture medium. Other winners include Norton Zinder. David Baltimore, John Beckwith, Liz Blackburn, Akiko Iwasaki, and many others. The credit, though, I think goes to all the people in the labs of, of my lab and all those people because it's, it's not us that makes science happen on a day-to-day -day basis where the rubber meets the road, and it's not us that puts everything all together. Yep. It's me. That's a great prize, and you're going to give a talk this afternoon? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Very tomorrow good. Tomorrow afternoon. Great. The other award, which I think is really neat, from the Girl Scouts of San Diego, <laughs> the 2016 Cool Woman Award. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. you, go back to small town Texas. I now have a piece of glass where it's etched that I am cool. Because <laughs> I wasn't then. <laughs> so you were part of a Girl Scout troop? Is that how that works? Or they no, just... they, um, 
they want to, the, what the Girl Scouts say is you cannot be what you don't see. And so they want to find adult women in San Diego doing interesting things and have them come and meet the Girl Scouts and interact with them so they can see what they're doing. And there's a lot of interesting people. So uh, they had me. They had a scholar in Chinese studies. They had the winner of Project Runway, who's the first designer of plus-size clothing. They had a woman who runs a farm that employs um, veterans that have come back with PTSD. And so she's teaching them horticulture skills, and it's sort of therapeutic. So there's just the, r the range of absolutely anything going on in Southern California. Hmm. Cool. Nice. Great award. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. That may be better than the Eli Lilly. Who knows? <laughs> well, I being able to prove that you're cool, that's... The, uh, that's you know. what attracted me. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Yeah. So we have a cool... Because none of us were cool in high school. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Like, the, like they have that on hand, you know, you show it to your kids. It's on. <laughs> well, my daughter went to the prom last week, and I said, I didn't go to the prom in high school because I was a nerd and a geek, and she said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, daughter. By the way, I just want to tell the audience, thank you for reminding me. We have a microphone there. You can get up at any time and ask questions. You'll be recorded for posterity. This recording is being sent into outer space. Yeah. Not, not really. But All recordings are just, ultimately sent uh, into outer space. Just stand up and one of us will see you and, and we'll take your question. But the thing about nerds, it's now cool to be a nerd. I know. I mean, Bill I Gates, know. pretty cool guy. Yeah, yeah. Wow, his think. talk the other day was amazing. Anybody see his talk? Wasn't that awesome? I got to sit in the front row, right? Because I'm part of the ASM governance, and they reserved two, two rows for us. I sat 10 feet from him, and he was amazing. Mm -hmm. He's a smart guy, and um, he's really on top of health policy and vaccines. And, you know, he said the most important thing is kids aren't being fed enough in many parts of the world, and that leads to infectious disease. I was just impressed. I, I, I emailed my son and, and my whole family, and I told them. I was so excited to sit in the front row, and my older son said, yeah, but his software is full of vulnerabilities. Because <laughs> well, my son is a, a cyber... a metaphor for public health. Yes. <laughs> that's right. Yes. My I, son I, is a cybersecurity major, that's why. Bill should know a thing or two about viruses. Yeah. No, very impressive, and it's great that he's giving all this money to health, right? Yeah. We need and he spends all of his time reading about it. And then when he asks you questions, he asks you questions on a level you'd expect from one of your colleagues. Right. Yep. He's great. Well, he's, he's, uh, he seems to have applied the same intensity to public health problems that he applied to, you know, monopolizing operating systems. So it's now using his powers for good. Someone asked, uh, he was interviewed by a medical reporter, Tom Besser, I think was his name, and he asked them, you know, how is it doing what you're doing, running your foundation versus running Microsoft, and he said, well, when I was at Microsoft, I worked all night, and in the morning I would ask people, did you finish the program? And he said, I don't call up the AIDS vaccine group and ask them every morning if they finish the vaccine. <laughs> he said, that's the big difference, because I give them two or three months, then I call them, <laughs> which is probably not enough. So let's talk about um, some of your work, which I have here summarized, structures of proteins from dangerous viruses. Is that fair? It's, it's not so much the danger of the virus as the simplicity of the genome. Okay. So, whereas, you know, you and I have 20, 25,000 genes that makes that many proteins with that many functions, um, Lassa virus has four genes. And those four protein products do probably 60 or 70 things that we know of in the virus life cycle. And so, the fundamental question of the lab is how does this very limited toolkit gain such a, a tremendous array of functions? How do these four proteins achieve so many things? Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, there are a lot of RNA viruses that are concise. Ebola virus has seven genes, some of the paramyxa virus is six. And many of them are, we know they're multifunctional, and so the question is how? Mm. And one of the interesting things we've found is that some of them change their structures to change their functions in a way that I don't think that we were expecting. Mm. That when we are <coughs> junior biochemistry students, we are taught that the sequence confers the structure and the structure drives the function. And when you want to make some mutations, you download the structure from the PDB and you look at that structure and that's the template for your mutagenesis. But what if there was some other structure that drove the other function? 
So uh, the Ebola virus matrix protein makes a butterfly-shaped dimer, and that traffics around the cell, and then it rearranges itself into an octameric ring that builds an RNA binding site, and that plays some role in controlling transcription. So that Christmas tree structure only exists inside the infected cell, not in the virus. And at a different stage of the life cycle, the butterfly traffics up to the membrane, and there's a different rearrangement, which makes a repeating hexameric filament, and that builds the shell of the virus. So we have a structure that makes the, the shell, which builds the virus, and a different structure, which binds RNA, controls transcription. And you can see how if you're making point mutations, some mutations might affect one structure, some might affect another structure, some might knock them all out. And so you need to understand the, the realm of accessible endpoints to these sequences that are carried by these viruses and probably other microbes and human genes as well to some extent. Well, this, uh, this kind of static view of the protein, you know, you have one sequence, you have one protein structure, I, I guess to some extent that grew out of the techniques that we initially had for analyzing protein structures, right? You make a crystal and you get one form of the structure and that's what you figure is the structure. It's not so much the crystal, because in crystals we can see thermal motion. Okay. In the crystal structure, every atom is described by X, Y, Z, and B. X, Y, Z is the position in space, right. and then the B is the motion from that spot. Mm -hmm. And so we can see motion, we can see disorder. We have other techniques, like small angle X-ray scattering, that can measure the range of something that isn't captured in a crystal. And you know, NMR can see some range right. of motion to some extent. Um, electron microscopy, still, you're, you need a homogeneous single conformer to get high resolution. The limiting factor is how you have made your protein. Right. What construct right. you have engineered, how you have purified it, what choices you have intentionally or inadvertently made in making that protein. Because if that polypeptide needs a certain biological factor to rearrange its other structure, and you didn't know that, and you didn't supply it, it won't go there. Or if in order to make it soluble and produce at high yield, you truncated seven residues off one terminus, that has driven it into some other structure. And without knowing that these other structures were accessible, you don't know what you've done. So in the, in the uh, VP40 structure, that's the protein number, mm -hmm. right? That you just talked, it has different conformations and different functions. How do you solve the structure of each? Can you, do you have to figure out the ways to trigger it from one to another? Right. This fell into our laps, really. Um, so it started in Grenoble, and they cracked the first structure uh, in 2000. This was way before we got involved. And then the scientists had figured out that if they manipulated the protein, they could get it to make these rings. And then they solved the structure of the rings. And so they provided the first template of mm -hmm. this is a range of conformers available to this protein. One confers an RNA binding site. And they had done, found an important observation that point mutations that prevent assembly of the ring do not affect budding of virus particles. So they had made that connection that it okay. makes this ring structure, but the ring isn't the matrix. The ring doesn't mm -hmm. bud. And then it, all that work was sort of ahead of its time because nobody had figured out a function for the ring yet. That came seven years later. That's Stefan Becker's lab. Figuring out that the ring maybe played some role in control of transcription. And then it was just... Uh, took some time and some brute force slogging through point mutations just to capture what the different things were. And okay. the important connection was finding point mutations that would drive it into only one structure right. Right, so okay. that you could assign mm -hmm. a function to that. Great. Yeah. So that's I guess particularly for structures that only show up in the infectious cycle for a short period of time, mm -hmm. you're going to have a hard time isolating those, obviously, right. unless you can find a mutation that will get it into that. Yeah. So are there, are there likely to be additional structures that don't show up with a particular point mutation that we just can't explore yet? I mean, are there other things that this protein might be doing? Sure, or other proteins. But or the, other, but the right. thing is, how would we know? Exactly. You know, right. if, it's, if, if you look it's an at, unknown unknown. Right. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you look at the sequence itself, it doesn't tell you that it will be, it's not intrinsically disordered. Right. Intrinsically disordered proteins like P53, you can peg them from your sequence and you know this thing it will adopt multiple structures, and you know you're looking for them. But other proteins like this, there's nothing about its sequence yet that we know that would tell us that we needed to look for other structures. And so one of the things I would like to do now is to try to look at the ones that we have in captivity, um, you know, Ebola, Marburg, Sudan, BP40, a range of sequences, but we know they do the same thing. 
um, I think losses Z might do this, an entirely different sequence, and try to learn is there something from these sequences or the contacts that build the structure or the energetics of these structure by which we could try to develop some bioinformatic rules or right. patterns to predict this. Because structural biology is a labor of love. It takes time, it takes money, it takes a graduate student willing to bleed <laughs> to make <laughs> these structures happen. And, some, it, and it really takes a leap of faith. If the structure's already in the PDB, you assume you've been scooped and you go work on something else, right? You, don't, you never tell your postdoc, we'll go solve a different structure of that sequence. <laughs> unless you had a reason. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. And you need something in the sequence or some biological observation, like a conformational antibody that would only bind it sometimes and in some environments. You need some reason to think that there might be more than one wildly different thing. So we, you've mentioned a couple of different uh, techniques for solving structures, X-ray crystallography, X-ray small angle scattering, small angle scattering. Uh, cryo EM. Could mm -hmm. we just review them? Mm -hmm. Do you still use all of them, or has one supplanted the other today? I view them as individual cards in a hand, and sometimes you play one card and sometimes you play <laughs> another. So uh, in X-ray crystallography, you require that your protein grow a crystal. And the point of the crystal is so that you have a couple hundred thousand copies of your protein all organized like soldiers in a three-dimensional array, and they amplify each other scattering. It's like one who in Whoville singing doesn't give you enough volume, but if all the who's <laughs> in Whoville sing simultaneously, then you can hear them. So that's the point of the crystal. And the advantage is that the tools and the software and the, the, the metrics for making sure you got your structure right are, are pretty robust for X-ray crystallography. You can get a crystal and it gives you some decent data, you're gonna get a structure. And you can get very high resolution, it's quite reproducible. If you can get a crystal, I would go that route. Mm. There are some things that will not crystallize for love or money. And now you have some other options. If it's small, you always have the option of NMR. If it's big, now I have the option of cryo-EM. Right. Um, but cryo-EM and X-ray crystallography alike, the battle is won and lost in the protein biochemistry. That in understanding and handling and expressing the protein to make it clean enough and homogeneous enough to get that high resolution. And that's where you have to be really smart as a biolog biologist or a virologist to figure out what have I done to this protein to make it look like this? Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from the image that we have captured? So once you have decided to solve the structure of a particular protein, you wait until you've purified it to decide what technique you're gonna use. Is that fair to say, or is it not that simple? Um, well, you know the size of it starting out. Mm -hmm. um, every lab has the technique that they are really good at. There are EM labs that might start there, and they've yeah. intentionally picked projects that are suitable for that. And then there are x-ray labs that might start there, and they've picked projects that are suitable okay. for that. When your favorite tool is a hammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We think of ourselves more as biologists, and we're thinking about the genome, and the genome's just handed you some protein which may or may not behave. And so we mm. spend a lot of time looking at that protein and figuring out how to get it and what, who do we need to talk to to bring the technique to bear to get this image that we want to have. Well, maybe your lab is the Swiss Army knife. You can do everything well. Well, it's not us. I mean, most structural biologists now are going this way. Well, they're not x-ray crystallographers or microscopists anymore. They mm. are biologists that use this as their major tool. It's interesting, because in the yeah. old days, so I used to collaborate with Jim Hogle, who was at Scripps right. many, many years yeah. ago. I don't know if you overlapped. Oh, yeah, all. a little bit. He had the office next to Ian for a while. And uh, he was a x-ray crystallographer. Right. But now he would probably get mad if I called him that. It's a biologist who's I'm or a sure virologist. Get mad. Um, <laughs> but that's a good point. Well, this I, I is like just that. the advancement of technology, yeah. right? I mean, no <clears throat> one is an electrophoreticist. <laughs> right. You just run a gel to get the answer you need. Right. So let's look at a couple of examples of your work and, and see how they arose and, and what they tell us. So the first one, uh, a recent one, the structure of ZMAP antibodies bound to the glycoprotein of Ebola virus. How, tell us how that... How did you start working on that? Uh, that was done by electron microscopy. We, that project we started through, we put together a global collaboration to look at antibodies against Ebola, Marburg, Lassa, Sudan, all those different viruses, mm -hmm. to try to together figure out at scale if we could make a better therapeutic and understand what the research pipeline should be to get there faster next time. Now, was this 
this was not a coincidence. This was uh, a result of the, the major outbreak. No, this started two years before the outbreak. This mm -hmm. was a coincidence. Yeah, okay. this was a coincidence. Um, we set out to do work on Ebola virus because it had a lot of structural problems um, that needed a structural biologist to look at, and that was 2003. And so we had been looking at the glycoprotein for many years and had been using antibodies to form the contacts to build the crystals to crystallize the glycoprotein. Because glycoproteins are glycosylated, they're floppy, they're hydrogenous. Right. And so we had a number of antibodies in the lab, and one of the ones we had worked with was one from a human survivor of the 1995 outbreak called KZ52. And it neutralized potently in cell culture. It protected mice from challenge, protected guinea pigs from challenge, but the primates all died. <laughs> and that was really disappointing. That was 2007, because that was the best antibody known at the time against Ebola virus. And so the field kind of thought, oh, if the best we have isn't good enough, what does this mean? Does this mean the antibodies are not effective against such a rapid virus? Does it mean that it need another dose? Does it mean they need another antibody? And then four years later, uh, four groups simultaneously published that while the one KZ52 wasn't protected, mixtures of antibodies could be protected. And so some of these were cocktails of just two or three monoclonal antibodies. And so we wondered, well, what's in these, what's in these cocktails and how are they working? And the surprise was that many of the antibodies in these successful cocktails were non-neutralizing. So they brought some function that wasn't measurable in cell culture. And so what was that and why was that helpful? And we thought this was kind of a puzzle at the time. And we couldn't compare the results of the studies because they were all given in different dosages and at different time points. So you couldn't really say what was the right cocktail or why it was the right cocktail or how you would choose antibodies to go into this cocktail because neutralization in cell culture did not necessarily predict protection in animals. Right. So what are you going to do? You can't start in primates. It's not ethical. No one has the money for that. You need to weed things out on the cheap in plastic. But if plastic doesn't predict what happens in vivo, and so we thought, well, okay, we, we, right now we're having trouble of small statistics. We've looked at half a dozen antibodies, and we don't understand anything. So we just need to do this on a bigger scale. And so two years before the outbreak, uh, we got together everybody we knew by calling them on the phone and put together a project that we called the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapeutic Consortium, VAC, the VIC. And the idea was just let's just get them all, give everybody antibody we can. We're gonna blind them all, give them code names so that nobody knows what we're working with and we can just do this very fair in a data-driven way. Put them through every assay we have and try to figure out what correlates with protection. And if the data is telling us that we need a mixture of antibodies as a therapeutic, we can probably make a better p mixture from a better pool. And so we thought we'd go about the study in two different tracks. I call them tortoise and hare, but the hare people don't like that term. <laughs> um, and so another way to think about it is like a rapid strategy to get something in place sooner rather than later, and a more expansive strategy to do a bigger, slower study. And the rapid strategy was the idea of Larry Zeitlin and Gary Kobinger. And they were going to take one proven cocktail of three antibodies, another proven cocktail of three antibodies. So just a sample size of six. They know that this group works and this group works. Mix and match just those six and see if they came up with something better, and that was Zima. And the sole goal there was a proof of concept, see if they come up with something better and faster, and we were just going to solve structures in a very rapid way through negative stain EM. Yeah, this is Andrew Ward at Scripps helping me with that. And uh, that was discovered, I think, sort of in the middle of the outbreak. And so we just wanted to find out how those antibodies worked and where are they bound. So the assays you're doing to, to try to predict what's going to be a better, a better one, you're not going straight into primates. You're trying to come right. up with assays in plastic that will presumably uh, correctly identify these two groups of three as a control and then hopefully identify some additional combination. Right. So the okay. expansive study, the tortoise track, we have 175 antibodies, and we have over 40 labs and five continents participating. And so we do biochemistry on all the antibodies, find out which bind GP, which bind which strains of GP, right. which bind which domains of GP. We do all the epitope mapping. Uh, ben Duranz's company is doing alanine scanning through there to you know, precisely map epitopes. We have, so we can take the, the pool of antibodies from around the world, figure out where they bind and how well and under what circumstances. Like, do they remain bound at the pH of the endosome once the virus goes in? And then we look at their ability to neutralize in cell culture 
and BSL-2, 3, and 4 assays. So the idea is to figure out if a pseudotyped VSV mm -hmm. is as predictive as a live Ebola virus assay. Okay. And can we develop something that is as accurate but faster and less painful than a plaque assay? And then when we put all of them... Not that there's anything wrong with plaque assays. No, plaque assays are great, but it <laughs> takes time. Yes. And if you're looking at 175 antibodies, that's, yes. that's a lot of plates. Yeah. And so we just wanted to compare the assays side by side to figure out, is, is there a difference? Is one more predictive than the other? One of the issues we'd found is that some of the antibodies, including one of the ones in ZMAP, neutralize under some conditions and not others. Right. And in some assays and not others. And so one lab says it's a neutralizing mm -hmm. antibody. Another lab says it's not a neutralizing antibody. And the difference is that they put their assay together differently. And so we need to understand what mm -hmm. these assays are. And there's no point in making any call for standardization if you haven't fully evaluated what each thing tells you on the same large box set of antibodies. Hmm. So that was the other goal of the collaboration, was to figure out what, what the right technique should be, and then at the end of the day, can we come up with a better therapeutic if we're looking at a broader pool? Mm -hmm. So out of, out of this came ZMAP, is that correct? ZMAP is a rapid proof of concept from six, so now we're mm -hmm. looking at the 175 to find out can right. we do better. So this structure that you published was done by cryo EM, is that right? Negative stain EM. Okay. What's the cryo one on the heels. What is negative stain EM? Negative stain EM is a, a fairly rapid technique. It would just take a couple of days, and you just get your purified complex, and you just drop it on an EM grid, a little copper grid, and you stain it with you know, a heavy atom like uranium and uranyl acetate, mm -hmm. and you can just take a picture and get a reconstruction at about 20 angstroms resolution. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know what side chains are involved, but you could say, this antibody binds right. to the top, the bottom, and it probably has this function, or we can bin it into this class. Okay. And I saw, <clears throat> I get press releases from Scripps, and I saw pictures of you holding this plastic model of the glycoproteins with three antibodies bound to it. Very nice. And you can see it was a low resolution yeah. model, but it tells you exactly where they're binding, right? Yeah, and that's the point, it's fast. So what did you learn from that? We learned that two of the three bind the same place, and they compete with each other. And hmm. so that raises an intellectual question. Do we need them both? Do hmm. they bring something slightly different, or does this give us an opportunity to replace a redundancy with a new function? If you can bring in a third binding site, you may be less susceptible to mutagenic mm -hmm. escape. Right. And then that helped us bin them with, uh, you know, there's one that binds the top, and it doesn't always neutralize, and it's not as potent as other antibodies we know. So. What is it doing? And that gave mm -hmm. us an opportunity to bring in other things like Galit Alter's work, trying to understand the different immune functions that each antibody brings to bear and that that's important. Right. One of the things we find in the expansive study is, you know, you grind through all the antibodies and come up with 16 winners that consistently neutralize and protect in the mouse model. There are 12 that neutralize but fail to protect. So it tells you neutralization is not enough. What you're measuring in cell culture is important, but it's not mm -hmm. the only thing. Mm -hmm. And there are seven that protect in the absence of any measurable neutralization. And so they are conferring survival in the animal model through something that isn't being measured in cell culture. Okay. Yeah, I think that's important to point out that cell culture in small animals, they don't tell you everything right. that you need to know. And so you had to cast a broad agnostic net yeah. over this yeah. just to say, you know, with a statistically large enough sample size, this is a true thing. Yep. So ZMAP was used in a limited fashion right. during the outbreak. If we were to have an outbreak tomorrow, would it be used or we're not ready? A lot of effort has gone into ramping up production and um, approval, and there's now been a clinical trial of it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges in the outbreak is, you know, can you do research in the outbreak? Is it ethical to deliver an untested therapy to a human. Well, on the one hand, um, Ebola patients aren't your guinea pigs. If it hasn't been tested in a healthy American, is it ethical to give it to these people? On the other hand, do you want to waste your doses in the mm. middle of an emergency on the guy who doesn't need it? Right. Or do you want to you know, throw that Hail Mary pass? It's like you're, you've fallen out of an airplane and someone's handed you a parachute, and they say, well, you know, we don't know. It's never been tested in humans before. <laughs> do you take a chance and pull the ripcord and see if it's going to work, or do you say, no thanks, it's not safe, I'm going to take my chances with the ground? 
I know the answer to that one. Yeah. <laughs> but Ebola is different. It's right? a different. It's a, it's a it's an acute infection. It's yeah. But uh, there's nothing better than ZMAP at the moment that we could put in people, right? There are very good monoclonals that could be better. They haven't progressed to the same level of okay. testing. Okay. Or a ZMAP, they have a better idea about, you know, mm -hmm. it's been in enough people. To right. So that brings me to this other paper that I wanted to go over, structural basis of Marburg virus neutralization by a cross-reactive human antibody. Oh, yeah. That Tell us fine. about that. So uh, Marburg and Ebola are different. They're, the, these filovirus glycoproteins have these heavily glycosylated domains. One's called the glycan cap, the other one's called the mucin domain. And they are attached to different places in Ebola and Marburg. Mm. And because they're attached in different places, it exposes or buries different surfaces of the glycoprotein for antibody reactivity. And so the neutralization hotspots for Ebola are different from Marburg. And so one of the consequences of that is that for Ebola, we get a lot of antibodies that anchor to the bottom, that look like KZ52. You never see those from Marburg because the mucin domain is anchored in that same spot. It's inaccessible. Mm -hmm. But for Marburg, all the glycosylated stuff is brought down to the sides, like elephant ears on the side of the elephant's head instead of bunny ears on the top. And that exposes the stuff at the top. And the important thing about the top is that's where the receptor binding site is. And if all filoviruses use the same receptor, that's a conserved site. And so Jim Crow has found antibodies in a survivor, an American survivor of Marburg virus infection that can bind that site also on all Ebola viruses mm. after it's been processed in the endosome to remove those heavily okay. glycosylated things. So when you say receptor, you mean the endosomal The endosomal humor, receptor. NPC1, yes. right? So that raises the question, does the antibody come in with the virus, and then when the receptor binding site is exposed, it binds, or can it bind outside of the cell? For Marburg, it binds outside the cell. Oh. As antibodies are raised in a Marburg patient. For Ebola, you'd have to target them. Okay. And can those antibodies neutralize both Marburg and Ebola? It neutralizes authentic Marburg virus. It will not neutralize authentic, unprocessed Ebola because it can't access its, episode, right. it, its epitope until it's been processed. Yeah. But you could develop it into something that did. How could you do that? Well, if you could target it into the endosome some other way, some other endosomal targeting sequence, mm -hmm. then it, you could find its epitope and neutralize. Ah. Or, or it gives you the arrow pointing to this site, and that tells right. you this is, you know, let's come up with a small molecule that ex Aim here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Access. So the receptor binding site seems like a good target for broadly neutralizing phylovirus antibodies. Right? It's one. There are others, too. What other ones? The stalk. The, ah, the section of GP2 that uh -huh. comes down toward the membrane that has some conserved okay. antibody binding sites. It's interesting because I have a question here which says, in flu, it's the stalk that's the target of broadly neutralizing antibodies and why the difference, but there may not be a difference. Right? There isn't a difference. And, you know, that's one of the fun things about working at Scripps is we have HIV people, we have flu people, we have hepatitis C people, we have Ebola people, and... Uh, we're coming up with the same ideas. Hmm. But for flu, you don't get an antibodies to the receptor binding pocket that are broadly neutralizing. Right, yeah, it's different. Well, there's a different receptor. It's not a, a protein. Yeah, there's a, sialic acid, but it's right. also highly variable up there, right. too, which yeah. may be part of the problem, right? Yeah. And we don't see that kind of variability with filoviruses, right? Well, right. The, this, there's a cloud of sequences yeah. accessible to influenza, and then the sequence yep. variability for filoviruses is comparatively really quite small. Right, right. Now, so, are, are you, um, obviously, there's therapeutic possibility in, in targeting these with monoclonal antibodies or what have you. Um, are you doing the, the converse, trying to come up with antigens that would elicit those antibodies for a vaccine? That's something that I want to do. That's work that we do want to do, is to figure out how you might reshape these antigens now that we know what antibodies we're looking for. Right. And we have mutant GPs that bind them better, can you use this to elicit? That's, you know, that's, it's a, it's a, it's where, where I want to mm. kind of go next. So I, I'm not sure how, how well you're familiar with this, but overall, if, if we had an outbreak of Ebola tomorrow, would be, what would we do? What, was there anything that we could do differently from the last outbreak? I think that public health would mobilize much more quickly mm -hmm. and nobody would be caught on their back foot again. They would know that the, one needs to 
move fast before you can't trace contacts. Um, I think that a lot of research started in the outbreak that may have some candidate treatments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were vaccines that worked beautifully in primates for the last, I don't know, decade, but there wasn't the funding or interest in the much more expensive human clinical trials right. because Ebola is so rare. But some of that work was done during the outbreak. So now we right. have the data that we would need to move different vaccines forward. And so you have the possibility mm -hmm. now, you didn't have as much before, of ring vaccinating. Right. So if a right. filovirus popped up somewhere else, you actually could ring vaccinate around there and, and keep the outbreak small. That's the way the last trial was running until the outbreak stopped. They were doing yeah. rim, ring uh, Now, vaccinating. on the other hand, if you have the infrastructure to do a ring vaccination, you probably have the infrastructure to do the much simpler things that would prevent this virus from spreading in the first place. But I mean to vaccinate a, a likely population? Well, to, right. I mean, we're talking about developing sophisticated vaccines against a virus that if you implement proper public health protocols and, and precautions, it's not terribly easy to catch. So you could limit the outbreak with, with much simpler approaches if you have the people on the ground to do that, and that was a large part of what was lacking. Conceivably, but there are a lot of things we still don't understand. We don't fully understand the reservoir. We don't fully understand right. how that contact is happening. Sometimes you can trace it back to a miner mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. hunter, right. but not always. The fact that it appeared in West Africa was, um, some say they predicted that, others, it was really quite unexpected for it to move that much. Um, and, you know, we do have the capability of vaccinating people, but what we don't know in humans is how long that vaccine would last and how you will access all these people. Right. You know. We heard from Bill Gates the other day that many people in Africa never see a physician in their yeah. entire life. Yeah. So... You know, and that's why we have, this is an interesting statistic, there are still up to 100,000 cases of congenital rubella syndrome, exactly. birth defects every year, caused by rubella yeah. virus, for which we have a vaccine, but many people don't get it. Exactly. And that's the other half of the problem. You can make great vaccines, but if you can't deploy them, right. it's useless. So last the virus is also an important hemorrhagic fever virus that doesn't get a lot of attention but causes a lot of illness. And you work on that as well, right? I do. What are you doing? A number of things. <clears throat> uh, we have looked at its nuclear protein to see how does it bind the genome. Mm -hmm. Why is it immunosuppressive? It turns out that it has a capability of digesting double-stranded RNA <laughs> as fast as it can make it. That's remarkable. And so what we'd like to do is figure out how the, the replication functions and then the immunosuppressive functions couple. Right. We've looked at the matrix protein, and we found that it makes two very different conformers to achieve its array of functions. There's a monomer that was solved by NMR from the Borden lab, and then we solved a dodecamer, another ring with an extremely basic center by X-ray crystallography, and there's a tremendous rearrangement and building of this ring. I want to figure out what that's mm. for. Hmm. We have worked with Tulane, and they, uh, this is Bob Gary and James Robinson, they've raised a large panel of antibodies from survivors in West Africa. And the idea is to see if these can be turned into therapeutics to give back to these populations because the only mm -hmm. therapeutic mm -hmm. is an off-label use of ribavirin. Right. So you can make something right, more right, specific, right. more effective, right. and have a better chance of treating loss of virus. So potentially you could solve the structures of these with the oh, glycoprotein. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you said when I invited you to TWIV. Said, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. You say that a lot? No. <laughs> but from Texas, I would think so, no. <laughs> so you... Um, also have solved a number of other filovirus proteins. Another, a couple of interesting ones, VP24, which is an mm -hmm. immune antagonist, right? Mm -hmm. And what does that do? A number of different things. Suppresses immune signaling through a different way in bystander cells. Um, and the mechanism, mechanisms of how are just now being figured mm -hmm. out and trying to understand what it interacts with and how it works. and. It, it also plays some role in replication, and it's scaffolded onto the nucleocapsid. And yeah, so, there's there's a lot, so these proteins are multifunctional. They are. VP35 is another one. Yes. It binds RNA, right? Yes. And that's so double-stranded RNA is a, is a signature of viral infection. Mm -hmm. It alerts the innate system, mm -hmm. so this shields it. Right? Yes. One domain shields it. So VP35 is a multimeric protein. Think of it as a bunch of tulips. So you got stems in the center, mm -hmm. and you have that are gathered in a bunch, and you got stems at the bottom splayed out and you've got a tulip domains at the top. 
The tulip domains at the top bind double-stranded RNA. They also bind the nuclear protein. The stems at the center gathers it into an oligomer. It has to be an oligomer to function in some viral species. And then the little individual base of the stems at the bottom chaperone the nuclear protein and keep it from binding cellular RNA hmm. to control how it assembles so it only assembles in a viral genome. Right. So of, of all the filovirus proteins, are there any that you haven't solved the structures of? L. L, the big one. Yeah. Which is the polymerase, right? Right. Are you trying? We haven't put a full court press on that. Uh, our hands have been full with other things. L is, expresses pretty badly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to take, it'll probably take, it's going to be a microscopy project because of the yield right. and the size of the protein. And it's going to take some effort in generating the right quality protein. And there are a lot of groups that are capable of doing that, but it's, there's a reason why it's the last yeah. right. <laughs> Well, L, L in general has been hard yeah. for the negative strand viruses, right, yeah. but VSV L was exactly. just solved. Nice piece of work. By Sean Whalen here in, uh, in Boston. So of all these structures, what's your favorite? My favorite. A tie between GP and VP40. Glycoprotein and yeah, VP40, yeah. yeah. The glycoprotein for, um, because it's a call to arms, you know, it was, it's, it's, it's the protein on the surface. It is the antigenic target of antibodies. It is the key molecule in vaccines. It is critically important for understanding how to defeat the virus. And that molecule galvanized a 50 hmm. lab five continent collaboration. <laughs> yeah. um, and I don't think that's happened before where you have yeah. that many scientists of that many disciplines willing to throw in their molecules to compare them side by side to figure out what's best and more importantly, why. Right. Why these molecules are better. It's not so much my therapeutic versus yeah. your therapeutic, yeah. but okay, let's figure out how these things are working and how we could streamline the research process to get there faster. So for it being called to arms, I would say GP. And for the gymnastics and the opportunity to learn something about protein structure that can inform us mm -hmm. for way beyond virology, GP40. Do you have models of them? on your desk? I do. <laughs> Speaking of models, let me show you. Here's something I think you might like. This happens to be Zika virus. This is a gift given to me by Mark Martin, who's here at this meeting. So this is a plate, yeah, and it's a glass rendition of the Zika virus particle. It's flattened, right? The, the single glycoproteins. This is made by uh, Jane Hartman, who is the owner of Trilobite Glassworks. She does glass art. And um, she's exhibiting here at this meeting. You should go check out her, her exhibit. There's a whole bunch of artists in the row downstairs, and they are wonderful. Anyway, this is from Mark. Thank you, Mark. That's I'm cool. not sure why you gave it to me, but it's really nice <laughs> uh, and cool. And, and there are other people down there with virus structures as well. You don't work on Zika, do you? No. Wow. The first person first I've met. <laughs> a virologist who's not working on Zika. Good for you. We, we gave it a lot of thought, and we thought, what? Ebola or Lhasa project, would we drop to pick up Zika? Right. Mm -hmm. And knowing that we are not experts in class two, we're starting on the back foot. Um, there are excellent structural biologists that have been working on dengue and chikungunya for a long time. We didn't think that we were needed. And, uh, you know, if, okay. if everyone drops working on endemic Lhasa or any filovirus that could reemerge at any time and stampedes off to work on something else, and then another outbreak comes, we don't know what virus is going to be that outbreak. That is admirable restraint. It could be, you know, some toga virus we've never seen before. Yeah. Right. It certainly is a stampede, isn't it? All right, I'm going to ask You're you... You're part of it, too. I admit, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's a very interesting virus, but you have to give me a break. Polio is about to be around. Well, yeah, exactly. You, you, <laughs> it was you can... obvious what virus to stop working on to switch to Zika for your lab. Yeah. But you can learn a lot by working with polio, and it gives you a system where the people sure. in your lab have been vaccinated, sure. and you can actually handle the pathogen that's relevant for human tissues and yeah. learn something about that. And how do you know there's not yeah. going to be another virus like it? Well, I, I, I totally agree. We had some internal pressure to uh, work on Zika. We had started working on Enterovirus 68, which caused an outbreak last mm -hmm. year. And we got funded to do that. And unfortunately, we got totally diverted away from that, which I think I, I have problems with, which I write about in the Zika Diaries, which is an ASM blog that I've picked before. And you can, you can 
listen to my angst on that blog. Because okay? <laughs> at this point in my career, I have no problem in being honest and talking about what, what I'm thinking about. So check that out. Since you're a good sport, I'm going to ask you uh -oh. this question. At what point in your well, just a second? At what point in your career did you have a problem talking about what you were thinking about? <laughs> okay, I'm. I'm the, did you know Alan Dove was my former PhD student, <laughs> who, who's a, a wonderful science writer now, and uh, so he, you should know me, right? Yes. Uh, you, how many years ago were you? I was. The, uh, I was in your lab in the '90s. Yeah. So. So I've always spoken you, out. You were, you were pretty okay. outspoken. Not as loud as your next door neighbors at the time, but you, you know, if people actually listened to you, you yeah. were pretty outspoken. Who were the next door neighbors? Saul Silverstein and uh, Arj of Stratiatus uh, initially. Oh my gosh, Arj. That's another, we should get him on the podcast sometime. We <laughs> We've have, already had Saul on. We've had the good, anyway, this is a fun question. And this is for you, Ray. Can you describe your research in 30 seconds to your mother? The most lethal viruses we know have very simple programming. We need to understand how this extremely simple line of code conveys so many functions to make people this ill. Is that good? That's less than 30 seconds. That's less than 30 very seconds. That was about 20. Great. Very good. Yesterday here we had a workshop training people to do that, and we took videos and Ray and Chris have them. The, the, that video is going to go up today so you can check it out at uh, the ASM YouTube website. ASM Facebook. Facebook also. Check it out. 30 uh, seconds is good because you can turn it into a, into a GIF in your Twitter feed. <laughs> so uh, here's, a, here's a cool thing you did that I want you to tell us about. Oh, so a couple of years ago I was, I was taking a cab from the airport in San Diego and that was one of the times I couldn't get you on TWIV. But uh, I heard you on the radio. The, t the taxi driver had the radio on, and it was you being interviewed. And I said, crap, that's the person I couldn't get. And he's like, what? what? <laughs> but you were talking about crowdfunding. I was. Tell us about that. How did that work? So I was a graduate student at Scripps, and I started my own lab at Scripps. And the internal hires you beg, borrow, and steal. There's no startup package. And so you know, the equipment that we had was what we were able to cobble together or buy off our grants. And we were doing fine in basic research. And then the outbreak came. And one of the things we had played with before the outbreak was in developing diagnostics. And this project started for Lhasa. And this was run by a company called Corgenix and Zalgen and then uh, the scientists at Tulane to make little dipstick assays, so they look like pregnancy tests, right? So in five minutes, two red lines, it's Lhasa. One red line, it's not. So you don't have to be able to read. You can do it in five minutes. It's very inexpensive. It's great if there's no electricity. And so it was, and you know, what do structural biologists do? We're protein factories. And our job is to make a lot of high quality protein as fast as possible. And so we were making the recombinant protein that was used to elicit the antibodies in that test and to use as the positive control in that test. And on a, a research level, that was not hard. But in the middle of the outbreak, when they needed many boxes of these tests and their Ebola version, that we were asked to make grams of our protein. Mm. And you know, we're an academic lab. <laughs> We're not, and you know, we, the FPLC we have is pretty old and wasn't high throughput and wasn't automated and it just wasn't gonna keep up with what we needed to do. <laughs> Plus at the same time, the antibody consortium was ramping up and we had to produce all of the glycoprotein to analyze 175 antibodies and to make, to purify the antibody GP complexes and size exclusion and just what we had wasn't going to suffice mm. at all anymore. And so I went to my institution and said, I really need some new instrumentation. I need these, an automated FPLC. And uh, you know, do you know a family that can help? What can we do? And they said, we'd like to crowdfund it. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> really? You're putting me out in the street? <laughs> <laughs> and it was relatively humiliating. But they said, OK, look, we have a lot of investigators that need a lot of things. And um, we think this could work. 
and we think you can do it. And I didn't see that I had a lot of other options. Mm. Because if you write an equipment grant, and that's a great idea, but that's you know, well over a year. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't have a year. Right. And uh, it worked. Every time I went on the radio, another $3,000 came in. And then <laughs> it was exhausting. But in two weeks, we had the 100000 we needed to buy the FPLC. What platform was it on? It was on CrowdRise. OK. And uh, I met a lot of families that were interested in the research. And we got some nice comments. I mean, uh, you know, some of the comments were, you know, I think it's shameful that our scientists have to do this. <laughs> and yeah, it is. But you know what? There's just not enough NIH money. Yeah. And, and the, but uh, most of the comments were, I'm glad I can do something to help which is constructive and permanent. Because if you give for gloves and tents, they get used up. But if you give for research infrastructure, it lasts. Hmm. And that FPLC yeah. helps every project in the lab, and it's going to be there for years. And it's a permanent improvement. And there are a hmm. lot of families that said that they wanted to, this gave them an opportunity to make a permanent difference. Yeah. And they were happy to have the opportunity to learn about the research. So a lot of those families have now come through and seen the lab and, you know. Nice. It's nice. Cool. So you yeah. raised $100,000. Yeah. And the scripts didn't take any of that? No. That's great because, you know, there's this indirect. If it was Columbia, they would have taken half. Right? <laughs> no, my, my institution generally wanted to help. And, and they felt that, you know, no institution has all the resources they want to help everybody they want to to the extent that they have. And in the middle of the Ebola outbreak, you could crowdfund something for Ebola. But, you know, there, for fundamental research on basic biological mechanism, you know, can you crowdfund something for actin research? Yeah. Right. So you would do that again if you needed a piece I of equipment? I don't know that it would work again. Uh, I think in a crisis situation right. where the people were mobilized, you most had a specific basic, moment. It was the headline of the day. Everybody was into it. People wanted to do something. We got tons of new listeners out of it. Yeah, it was. <laughs> when it's, well, yeah. Well, but right now, Zika is generating similar sentiments. You can go to experiment.com and other sites and get, you don't get as much money. You can get fifteen, twenty thousand yeah. dollars $20,000 for some, ex people are willing to fund that, I think. But I was always worried that the universities would take big chunks because they would like to get a piece of any money that comes in. And it's nice that that scripts didn't do depends that. Depends on the university. It does depend. And uh, we, we would lose a lot of it. I'm not sure how a crowdfunding would work anyway. One of the things, I mean, you don't have to be able to, you don't have to be an artist to enjoy art. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know how to play the violin to like to listen to music. And I think that, you know, you don't have to be a practicing scientist to appreciate and want to learn about science. Right. And I think For there sure. are a lot of people that, that see this as important and see that this is our permanent way out of problems. And, you know, disease sends us into poverty. Poverty causes disease. A, mo a lot of our social ills are the result of health care inequity or infectious disease. Mm -hmm. and, and they want to make a difference in the world. And they see research as the way to do that. I have one last question for you, and this is, you know, we have a lot of listeners who are early in their science careers, and, you know, science is hard right now, and they'd probably like some advice from you on what they should be doing. They need, I would say, two things. Seek out a project that is compelling and is important, and is the most important thing you could think of to do. Because you can't do the work if you can't get it financially supported. And in order to get it financially supported, you need to be able to write or speak a compelling piece of prose why this is the thing that needs to be picked among 100 worthy projects. And if you are not compelled and driven yourself by that project, it won't come out in the prose. You also need that personal investment that you think this is the most important thing you can do with your time in order to keep picking yourself up and dusting yourself off and starting again mm. every morning when the last 99 things you did completely failed. <laughs> you also need to surround yourself by people that will lift you up and give you ideas and support you. All right, great That's advice. Uh, we have a few more things for you on this TWIV, but before we get to those, I want to tell you about our sponsor for this episode who helps make this possible, and that's CuriosityStream. 
they're the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. Over 1,400 titles, 600 hours of content. They also have 4K content. It was founded by John Hendricks, who's from Discovery Communications. So you're guaranteed access to real science shows, not reality TV shows. It's available on many platforms, the web, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire and Kindle, Apple TV, 196 countries. And what they have, and what I think is of interest to our listeners, is a wide variety of science, technology content, nature, history, and many more topics. They also have interviews and lectures, for example, Stephen Hawking's Universe. They also have a few pieces on viruses. There's one called Viruses, Destruction, and Creation. They have Life on Us, a series exploring the biodiversity of our bodies, Jason Silva on transhumanism and secret life underground, the secret world of organisms that populate the underground world. Monthly and annual plans are available starting at $2.99 a month. That's $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee out here on the convention floor or the cost of one title on competing online uh, on-demand platforms. Enrich your life and continue learning with one of the largest 4K libraries on the internet. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up and you will get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series free for the first 60 days. That's two months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank CuriosityStream for their support of TWIV. And I have two emails uh, that I would like to read and a couple, we'll do a couple of picks and wrap this up. And the first one uh, I, I picked because the writer is in the audience today and it's a lo they're both lovely emails. Uh, all our emails are lovely, are, right? Usually. Usually. Yes. We've had a couple of unlovely emails, but... This is from Suzanne who writes, Dear Professor Racaniello and the entire Twi TWIV team. Hi, everybody. Every week I listen to you telling me that you welcome my email and I am finally writing. I listen to audiobooks as I drive and some years ago fiction ceased to hold my interest. I loved science as a child but I allowed myself to be discouraged by circumstances. I decided that there was no reason not to continue learning now even though I followed a different path and have had a long career as a librarian currently at a community college. I always enjoyed helping science students with their research and I began listening to science books for the general reader. For the Love of Physics by Walter Lewin, several books by Sam Keane, and everything I could find by Richard Feynman. Then I tried one of those audio courses, Unseen Diversity, The World of Bacteria by Betsy Dexter Dyer. I was hooked. I listened to the entire 14 lecture series four times and continued with her audio course on basic genetics. Then I discovered your podcasts, which are absolutely fascinating. Of course, there was much I did not understand, and it made a huge difference to me that you consider Caleb might be listening too. As I listened and learned, I decided I wanted to learn more. So last fall, I enrolled in a general biology course at my college, and then in the spring, I took microbiology. I lived in a constant state of amazement as I learned. I joined ASM and decided to come to Microbe 2016 since I live near Boston. So here I am in the convention center lobby writing to you. I will be attending the TWIM and TWIV recording sessions while I am here. In closing, I need to tell you something that is very important to me about your podcasts. I'm beginning to understand how scientists think and how they work together asking questions and solving problems. Your passion to communicate science to the general public is incredibly important, and I offer my deepest gratitude to you and your esteemed scientific colleagues. Sincerely, Suzanne. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. This, is just, this embodies, I'm, I'm crying, this embodies, <laughs> what, this embodies what we have s sought to do at TWIV. This is what we're aiming to do, thank you. Since That's the very first day, it's perfect. And you got applause for it as well. Yes, <laughs> next door there. Uh, it. Alan, can you take the next Sure. Uh, Lot or Lottie writes, uh, hello, Twivom. I hope you're all doing well. First of all, I'm a German civil engineering student, and I'd like to thank the Twix podcasts for helping, me keep, for helping keep me sane, especially during my exam periods. There's only so much math a normal person can tolerate. I like the format. I like the hosts. I like the guests. I like the way you talked about getting more women into the program during the first episodes, and then you did it. I like how you let your guests talk about the things they do, how they do it, why they do it. 
A lot of the reporting on women scientists has been about who they are rather than what they do. For me, an ordinary curious person who is surely no great genius, reading those kinds of accounts made it seem impossible to ever become like those great people. On the other hand, hearing amazing scientists like your guests talk about what they do makes me feel like I want to do what I can and, and just see where that takes me. At the beginning, I found the weather a bit annoying, but working my way through the back catalog took me two years. I've done it. I realized that it helps me to put things into a context, to see the findings discussed that day as findings of that particular time, not some timeless ethereal quantity which will be true forever. Plus, it helps me get an understanding of how Fahrenheit feels like. Yes. Uh, another point that's been made several times was you checking facts while recording. I think that's exactly the way it should be done. Every single one of you marks the things you say according to how sure you are about their accuracy, how much of it is speculation, how up-to-date the information is, and you double-check when, when you're just too unsure. Showing how you do it is teaching people like me how to do it ourselves, as well as how to accept the ambiguity and incompleteness of information that's necessarily part of reality. As for you guys, these are, these are various threads that we've had on the show, for those of you who haven't been listening regularly, um, the use of you guys. Uh, there's an easy way to check whether an expression is gender neutral or inclusive or gender absorbent. That is, imagine addressing a group of women. Would you address them, you guys? On the other hand, I don't think an expression like this by itself is a problem as long as the people addressed know it is meant to include them. Problems arise when a minority first enters a group and they can't simply assume they are being included with terms like that. They have to either act on the assumption that they are included and risk being openly rejected when they aren't, or ask, and asking makes them stand out as if they wanted special treatment. And I think you guys is kind of a, like a Northeastern, especially I think of it as a New Jersey, New that's York. That's use guys. Use guys. Right. I would advocate. And the Mason Dixon line, by the way, is the y'all use line. Yeah. I grew up in Maryland, and it was y'all there. And, the, and I lived in Philadelphia for a number of years. It was use mostly in, in Philadelphia. I will advocate for y'all. I, I prefer y'all. It is gender neutral. Exactly. It is inclusive. There's y'all. Yes. There's all y'all. All y'all is plural. <laughs> y'all is, and, yes. Yeah, you is one. Y'all is a small group. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, we've had that suggestion, right? I, I think I brought that up before. Yeah. Um, all right, continuing the letter. Uh, there's little I could say about the content of the papers discussed. I'm trying to learn, but I'm still a layperson. But I wondered if you might ask Ted what kind of computational skills were necessary for the paper on IRVs. Okay. Uh, heads up to the Perpetuum Mobile Rich, cho uh, rich Chose. Oh, per Perpetuum Mobile Rich Chose. You can get that kind of motion with the help of a magnet. Oscillations are relatively good at conserving energy, but the mechanism in question would lose quite a bit at the joints and when transforming potential to kinetic energy and back. Without feeding back energy into the system, the motion would dampen. Now, this was a pick that Rich had. Some perpetual motion thing. Yeah, it's a, it looks like a perpetual motion machine, but of course it's not. Um, on this podcast, we obey the laws of thermodynamics. Um, I would do it with an electromagnet. Sadly, the creator gives no measurements for the mechanism. I wish you a great week, and I'm looking forward to the next 150 and more episodes. Right, so, thank you. so this uh, Irv question is about the... the so Ted was right. from uh, Welkin Johnson's lab. We talked yes. about... Um, now, I, I noticed Nell Zeldi... It, it took me a moment. Was it Ted? Uh, Nell Zeldi is out there. Can you comment on what kind of computational skills are needed for that paper? Because I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah, I'm making you come up to the mic. Yes. Yeah. Right here. Nels Eldi is from This Week in Evolution, one of our other podcasts. Um, Don't you love being put on the spot? Yeah, thank you, Vincent. Great to be here. I'm a little <laughs> late to the party. Looks like the festivities have started. Um, yeah, so quantifying IRVs uh, is a, sort of a delicate business because these endogenous retroviruses are um, sort of degrading so rapidly in genomes that you have to work on the consensus sequences. And so that's what you do first, and then you can categorize them into families. And then there's actually some fairly straightforward, out-of-the-box algorithms that you can use to um, mm -hmm. get those kind of calculations. So are you and, a computation? And to, time, and to time them out as well. Are you a computational biologist? You know, I'm kind of one of these, um, you know, jack of all trades, masters okay. of none. So, so could um, you do this? Yeah, we would do this. And, there or, you go. or we would talk to someone who could help us okay. and then go from there. I think that's, you know, collaboration can be a way forward in a lot of these cases. All right. Thank you, Nels. Thank you. Great episode. Uh, keep up the great work. You too. <laughs> I'll be in the back row if you need me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alan, let's do a couple of sure. science picks. What do you have today? Uh, I have a video. 
um, and I've linked to it in the show notes, and I guess we'll put that uh, on the site. Uh, but I th I'm pretty sure if you Google slime lapse, you'll, um, you'll come up with this video. It's from uh, California Academy of Sciences. It is um, uh, interviews and uh, time-lapse video footage combined with researchers hmm. who are working on slime molds, which if you're at ASM, you're probably at least broadly familiar with slime molds. Um, and, but the, the research questions they're asking are really kind of cool. How do these slime molds navigate across the forest floor, and how do they make decisions? And at first I thought, oh, we're anthropomorphizing here, but they make a compelling argument for slime molds actually deciding on courses of action, and they need to be able to do that in order to choose, well, do you go this way to find the food, or do you go that way to find the food? And they're doing a series of time-lapse videos that are just mesmerizing to watch. These you great. see these things crawling along and, um, and finding various oh, things. And, uh, yeah. I saw a fascinating demonstration at EG. It's this TED-like meeting, and they had slime molds and culture dishes linked electronically to a piano. And you could play a piece on the piano <laughs> and through cool. some mechanism, this was turned into information, and the slime mold would repeat this back in something similar. And so if you play Chopin, it comes back with something Chopin-like. <laughs> if you play a folk tune, it comes, I, I, I was amazed. I didn't know how it worked. Hey, They're folk, smarter than they look. This is done at New Jersey Institute of Technology, yeah. where you guys are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, nice. It's a beautiful video. You got it, is. Ray it's... and Chris, you should check this out. Okay, thank you, Alan. So my pick is self-serving. It is Virus Watch, which is a new video series I started a few weeks ago. I now have five videos up there, so I figured it's gonna stay for a while. So I make short videos of myself explaining things about viruses. And I record and produce and edit and post them myself because I wanna get them up quickly. I try and do one a week. So I did one explaining uh, the structure of Zika virus glycoprotein and its binding to a, a neutralizing antibody. And I taught myself how to use MacPymol so I yeah. could make all the illustrations and animations. I did one last week on Are Viruses Alive? And my goal is, I'm doing this because my kids said, Dad, you make too long stuff. It's way too long. You know, my kids are the YouTube generation. They want two minutes or three minutes. So I did it, and it's a good idea because it's a different audience from these podcasts, and I'm having a blast. And, and they really uh, are, you have been doing a good job keeping them short. They're like oh, five minutes, I think. Absolutely, less, less than 10 minutes for sure. Um, I would like to do five minutes. Um, but you know, I have limited graphic skills, so one of the reasons we're doing some crowdfunding of our own is so that I can hire someone to help out with it. Anyway, Virus Watch, it's on youtube.com slash P-R-O-F-V-R-R. I love the poliovirus model you had on the last one. That was cool, the genome inside. Yeah, so Anne Palmenberg gave me a plastic model, which is from uh, Roland Rueckert days. It's from like the 70s and 80s, and it's hollow. It's of the shell, and inside it is the genome that she beaded. Ah. She put the whole genome together, 7,442 bases of, of polio, with four different color beads for the four bases. It's Isn't in the right wonderful? sequence. She did it on a little thin wire thread. It's almost a rosary for the virus. It's a rosary, right. that's right. Well, and, and he can pull the genome <laughs> out of the virus. Please make my experiment work. And, yeah. Please make my experiment work. <laughs> I can pray to my virus, absolutely. Hail VP4 full of virus. You know, it's a great, so I use it a lot in the videos because uh, it's very visual. And I use it for teaching. I show the students, you pull out the genome. It takes me about five minutes to get the whole genome out, which is a process that in an infected cell, of course, happens like that. And it's, so it just tells you that there's something magical about how the genome is put in the capsule. So it's, it's a wonderful, it sits on my desk. It's my, my virus is polio, so my model sits on the desk. But this is before you could actually print the nice three-dimensional model. It's made of plastic, and they hand-colored the, the protomers with a magic marker of different <laughs> colors. It's, it's very crude, but it's fun. Uh, we have some listener picks. Uh, Alan, want to take that first one? Sure. Patricia writes, hi, Twivists. You've heard all the lovely things I have to say about you before, so I'll keep the glowing part short. Oh, no, don't. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention that I owe you all for a great explanation, expansion of my scientific knowledge in both biology and meteorology. 
I also owe you all for entertaining me for the cumulative months I've spent in the tissue culture hood throughout my PhD and now my postdoc, so thanks again for all you do. The weather in New York City is amazing. If only we could keep it like this all summer at a balmy 20 degrees C, to know what that is in Fahrenheit, so I apologize, uh, and with not a cloud in the sky and just a gentle puff of, air, of fresh air every few minutes to remind you that a breeze is possible in the lab. It's currently 17 degrees C with an aggressive blast of cold air from the AC <laughs> vent above me. I'm actually writing with picks that, are wel that you are welcome to break up across episodes since there are a few, but we're gonna do them all here? Okay. Uh, first and most urgently, the NECSS, Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism, NECSS.org, running May 12th through 15th in New York City. Yes, we missed okay, it. Okay, missed that one. Um, uh, so uh, if, if someone's picked it in previous years, I missed it, but I'm very excited to go, uh, and we missed it this year, so maybe keep in touch for next year. Uh, second, despite, since despite what I assume are your best efforts, you do not produce enough hours of twee podcasts to fill all my hours in the hood, here are a couple of other podcasts I'm enjoying. Uh, started out with People Behind the Science, peoplebehindthescience.com, where Mary, Marie McNeely, an American neuroscientist, interviews researchers from all walks of science. She's got a fairly formulaic set of questions, but the responses are quite interesting. She specifically requests advice for budding scientists from each guest, which I find very, very informative. And having chatted with a lab mate about the People Behind Science podcast, she mentioned it sounded a lot like BBC's Life Scientific, which I then downloaded and fell in love with, and that's my last pick, and that's on the BBC site. Uh, Jim Al-Khalil is a physicist. He interviews a lot of high-profile scientists for BBC Radio 4. Because of the nature of the people he interviews, he asks a little more hard-hitting questions and delves into current events and historical conflicts between scientists or disciplines. It's also a very enlightening radio show to, uh, turned podcast. All the best, keep up the excellent work. And then P.S., my computer went a little nutty yesterday when I was first trying to send this email. So today's weather is a little less perfect. Only 17C, still sunny. The lab AC has not let up, and thus it's probably closer to 16C and no sun. 20C is 68F. 68F, That's right. the way I remember it. All right, my last uh, pick is from Peter, and I love this one. This is awesome. Greetings, TWIV team. I saw this eBay listing and thought it might make a listener pick of the week. This is a listing for a Drinker Collins Iron Lung Respirator Museum piece, serial number 345, built in 1937. Iron Lung, this is what they used to put polio wow. victims in. This is a museum quality collectible medical artifact in restored working condition. The Iron Lung was invented by Philip Drinker at Harvard School of Public Health. This is the oldest iron lung remaining of those manufactured by the Drinker Collins Company. This is serial 345. Based on the seller's research, less than a handful of these Drinker machines remain in museums. It was the first iron lung in South Dakota paid for with community funds raised by the American Legion. It was discovered in a construction yard, purchased by the seller, and initially restored on the History Channel show American Restoration, the episode titled American respiration. Ah, you get it? Yes. You get it? Uh, extens I had nothing to do with that title. <laughs> ex extensive additional detailed restoration, mostly by the seller, has followed. After this show was filmed, the iron lung was displayed at the Deadwood, South Dakota Hospital, where it was first delivered in 1937 at the historic Homesake Opera House in Lead, South Dakota, where funds were raised in 1937 to purchase the respirator and at the Journey Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota. The machine weighs over 800 pounds, but rolls easily on six casters. And the listing, it's still, uh, bidding has ended and it has not sold. The, they put it up again, the, the uh, opening, opening at 14,000, or you can hit the buy it now price for 18.5. I think you need to rebuild the wall of polio around it. Yes. <laughs> yes, we'll have to crowdfund to raise the yeah. price to buy it. And this. the shipping. So it's a very nice, uh, very nice <laughs> photograph of it here, and uh, it's green and it's got wheels. And there's a, another one of these in the Technology Museum in Munich, which I visited a couple of years ago. It's in the museum. It's very cool to see these. And they used to put you in this to help you breathe if you had polio until you could recover. And most people did recover uh, their ability to respire, but there were a few people, at least in the U.S., who remained in iron lungs for nearly their entire lives. And, one woman, for example, died a few years ago. She had been in an iron lung for 30 or 40 years. 
and she chose to stay there. You can come out and breathe in other ways, but she chose to stay there, which is quite interesting. Anyway, that's an amazing find. An iron lung. Hospitals used to be full of them, and now we have none, which is good. Yes. All right, that's episode 394. We're coming up on 400. We're going to have a special episode in New York City where we, the whole team, gets together at Columbia. We're going to have a special guest. And have we mentioned the guest? I don't think we've mentioned the guest. Should, Should we? we? If we're going to in advance, this would probably be the episode to do it at. Should we mention who the guest is? Will it make you not listen? To I, think, I think when they hear who the guest is, they'll probably want to listen. What did you say? No, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. I think there's a general favoring of yes. Yeah. Harold Varmus. Harold Varmus. You know who Harold Varmus is? Nobel laureate for oncogenes. Uh, president of, is it president of NIH? Is that the name of the position? Uh, director. He was NIH running the place director, for a while. Yeah. Uh, president of Sloan Kettering. He's now in, running a lab in New York City, so he agreed to come up. And we'll have video. And if you want to ask him questions, you should send them in. Uh, TWIV at microbe.tv. Before we close up, anybody have a question or a comment here? It's your last chance. Yes, go ahead. Sure. Go for it. We love getting your questions and comments, whether live or dead. Dead at twiv at microbe.tv. <laughs> Who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? Hi, I'm Andy. I'm a grad student at Arizona State University. And uh, our lab works on expressing recombinant proteins in plants. So um, Erica was talking a bit about ZMAP, which was actually made that way. So it's kind of an up and coming thing, I guess. It's not, it's not that common at this point. I was just had a question for whether um, any of the stuff that she's done has involved proteins expressed in plants, uh, any of the purification or anything that you end up doing, uh, or if you or just some, or just a basic question also about some of the different expression systems, like you were saying, you can't express the L protein very much um, if you tried different expression systems and for doing that. The, a lot of the antibodies we've worked on have been made in plants, and it's done at Kentucky Bioprocessing. And the idea there was that for most of these diseases, the therapy is going to have to be donated, and so they're looking for an easy, cheap way to make a lot of it. And then also the glycans are different on the antibody, which can enhance some of the immune functions, so looking at that. For the structural biology, we find that we spend so much time trying to modify the construct and whipping things around, we might have to make three or 400 versions of the glycoprotein to get one that diffracts well. And so we're looking for systems that are really, really fast. And so we've done those in different ways, but the antibodies have been made in plants. And L, we just haven't really given it the full core press. Yeah. Now, I, I can't help but wonder if I could express it in plants, since that's what I do. It takes about four days for us to make you know, milligram quantities, so hey. <laughs> We'd love to work with you if you can do it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to reinforce the crowdfunding. I was driving down the freeway in Southern California, and on comes Erica, <laughs> along with John and Ken, who were two shock jocks in the afternoon on one of the big radio stations. And they said, we're trying to cure Ebola, and Erica Sapphire is going to do it. So call in and donate money. And I think you were at about $65,000 then, and, yeah. and working your way up. But it actually came across extraordinarily well, well enough that I stopped and, and donated. And I know <laughs> you <Mike>. well. <laughs> so it, it really was quite inspiring. And the other, the other anecdote is that you remember this yourself. You gave a seminar in the spring of 2015, and I had an undergraduate at the time who was in one of my classes, a girl with flowers in her hair, who asked you a very, very perceptive question at the end of your talk. And everybody looked at her and said, who is that? Mm -hmm. Well. She now has finished a 199 project in my lab, an independent research project, and is headed off to the NIH uh, for a two-year post-baccalaureate fellowship based on that question that she asked you. So wow. the inspiration comes from all different quarters. Thank I remember you. being really impressed at how the, the quality of the students that you have and how they, they listened intently through a whole seminar and came up with an expert-level question. That's only the ones that come to the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's Michael Bookmeyer from UC Irvine. An old friend, thank you. I, I have the pleasure of, of presenting the Eli Lilly Award tomorrow. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you, Mike. I'm Martha Carlin, and I, like you, am a citizen scientist, and I listen to all your episodes and learn lots from it. But I have um, two things. One is a, a crowdsourcing, uh, a different idea for crowdsourcing science. There's actually a Princeton project out of the Sung Lab called iWire, where they have developed a game um, to map the neurons of the brain that 
anyone can do, and they are mapping all of these neurons. And so I suggest for you, Erica, you might want to talk to them and see how they've done that, because what you're doing is a structural type thing. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of people, kids, whose brains kind of think like that. The game Minecraft is somewhat mm -hmm. like that. And you're trying to solve a problem that maybe somebody coming from a different angle might be able to mm -hmm. help you in a game playing type way. I think okay. there, are, there are actually a couple of efforts uh, among computational biologists to try and gamify protein structure determination, aren't there? Yeah, there's one at Scripps where they have a citizen scientist particle picking for electron microscopy, because right. humans are still better at that. Yes. And then if you're standing in line at the DMV, you might as well pick some particles. It's, it's, it's <laughs> just as therapeutic as jewel box right. for a couple minutes. And then I'm involved in an effort with IBM uh, on the world community grid. The idea is that your PC or your phone, when you're asleep at right. night, is idle. It could do some small piece of calculation. So they're doing in silico drug screening against a number of viral targets. And they have a lot of different projects. Some are from HIV, so that your, you know, your devices don't have to be idle when you are. And then from one of your other episodes, I think it was maybe one of the evolutionary ones, where they were talking about the ERV. Um, I'm just wondering, after watching um, the CRISPR talk last night, if perhaps that could be the human CRISPR. I don't know. There's some <laughs> frontiers. It's fascinating technology. There's yeah. a lot we can do with it. All right. That is, as I said, TWIF394. You can find it at iTunes. You can find it at microbe.tv, microbeworld.org. Questions and comments, we love getting them. TWIV at microbe. TV. And do consider becoming a patron of TWIV and help us to travel, to get help producing these episodes, uh, not just TWIV, but all the other microbe TV family of shows. You can contribute as little as a dollar a month. We have a goal of $5,000 a month, which will really help us to hire someone and travel. Patreon.com slash microbe TV. And if you don't like the idea of subscribing, you can give us a chunk of money, go over to microbe.tv slash contribute, and we have PayPal and credit card buttons there for you as well. My guest today, our guest today, Erica Ullman Sapphire, is at the Scripps Research Institute. Thank you so much for Thanks joining for us. Me. Thank you. You're really cool. Oh, thank you. So <laughs> you. <laughs> Officially. Officially. Officially cool. cool. You get the TWIV Cool Scientist Award. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you always for a drive, pleasure. Thank you for driving out here. I appreciate it. You yeah. had to get up early. I had to get up early, but it was not a bad drive. And, um, and it was worth you it. You had fun. Definitely. You going to stick around for the meeting? There are a couple of um, good talks. I may, I may look around a little bit, but I, I need to get Go to the back. exhibition floor and check Go out. Shopping. Go yes, shopping. Yes, right. Go shopping. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very cool. Uh, I want to thank the audience for coming as well. I really, really yes. appreciate it. I, of course, am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for letting us do this here. We appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. I also want to thank our producer, Chris Kandayan, the man with the headphones over there, and Ray Ortega, Ray Ortega who's a media specialist and a all, all media. media. He does all media. You can find watercolors <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On Twitter, he's he's at the podcast helper, the at podcast helper, and uh, the podcasterstudio.com is his website. If you want to do a podcast, he can help you out. Um, and um, I want to say that you have been listening to this week in virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Once you're in the BSL-4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shock. It's an unusual room, never seen anything like this. Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an R scan. So the HIPAA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? 
Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building. <laughs>